Welcome, my name is Brandon Searle and I'm the chair of the Board of Directors for Building Transformations. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today we have Christian Prillhofer uh, from Prillhofer Consulting joining us. Christian is the owner and CEO of Prillhofer Consulting. He began his professional career as a mechanical engineer and in 1994, he founded his company in Germany. <clears throat> Since then, Prillhofer Consulting has established itself as the world market leader in planning and consulting for industrial production. And numerous factories have been planned worldwide and the precast concrete building system has been successfully introduced. So while I uh, wait for Christian to uh, come on the screen and present, I wanted to let the audience know but that Christian's gonna spend about 40 to 45 minutes presenting today and then we'll have an opportunity for q a at the end if you can submit your questions through the comment uh box on the side that would be great and i'll keep an eye on them and at the end um we'll i'll ask christian live so it's all captured as part of the recording and with that i'll hand it off to you christian thank you thank you hello everybody thank you brandon i'm very happy that i can present and show a little of our work and what we did for the the uh, prefab industry. Apple Hoffa Consulting, as Brandon said, we were established 30 years ago. Now we work worldwide and most important is we are independent company means we are not uh, selling any machine, software or other things, just consulting and planning. And we think this is very important for everybody who goes into this process that they get advice and everything without being forced to buy a machine from certain suppliers or software or something else. I will start with productivity in construction. In UK, years ago, they were investigating why productivity is so low and companies like McKinsey's and others, they published also a lot about this issue. And what was found out from all of them what was that less to less information was available on the building side and this leads to this low productivity in construction so BIM was invented and since that time we are talking a lot about BIM but the implementation up to now is i would say poor data in construction uh, when where does the data that we want to use are coming from? Data must be made by all the parties that are involved in the billing process. And when we have this data, or how do we create this data with CAD systems, with other things? And how much of this data do we create to get the BIM model? Is it just a model for advertisement or is it a model for production? This means the big difference is in the model itself, in the accuracy and in the, in the number of details. Having the model means we have the information to build. But the art is then to use the data direct from the model, not via drawings on tablets, on paper, or on other things. Because when I have the data and I go back from the data to the human factor, I have problems with inefficiencies, failures, and a lot of things in the process itself. How is data usage today? When you look at the picture above, you see on the building side, it's not so easy to use direct data from a BIM model or from other sources. We would use projectors or other things that we can use the data direct not to be interpreted by a worker on the billing side who has to orientate itself on the billing side what to do and how to do this. When we use data in prefabrication, we are in a factory environment. Means data can be used from the BIM model. Maybe it has to be translated from a vector orientated model to a machine language model and then I can use it. I have the data in the factory and I can produce the parts 
and what is left over on the building side is just the assembly. But the assembly itself needs much less data as the production. And so having data in the factory, I can use nearly all of the data. The only thing what is left over is the data to install the elements on the building side. And when I have very good, very complete elements, then the work which has to be done on the building side is quite low because the electricity, HVAC, everything is in the parts and I don't have to care about that because I just assemble the parts and the rest comes by itself. Data usage in the past in the precast industry. So between 85 and 90, personal computers, CAD systems, and PLCs were available and affordable. And so the industry was eager to use the data. And why? Because every building is individual. And due to that, I cannot use data from a database like in car industry or in other industries. When I build a new building, I have to create a new set of data and I have to start again and again. And so the idea was born to make the drawing in the CAD system and then use the data direct in the factory environment. So what was done, large scale plotters were used to go over the beds and mark the total geometry of the elements with lifting anchors, with openings, with everything. And also reinforcement at this time wasn't made by meshes or other things, it was done by individual bars. So there was straightening and cutting machines and the data were also used for these machines to do this in an automated way and the workers just have to place them then on the bed. And all this was done long before BIM or other things were invented. It was done to be more efficient, to reduce failures and to get better quality. And at this time, middle of the 80s to the 90s, fax machines or modems or other things were used for data transmission. So what was done, a floppy disk in the factory into the machine and the data go direct from the PC with a floppy disk into the, into the machine and we had 100% use of the data that were created at this time. How is the data used today? Today, in theory, we have the BIM model, but in reality, most of the models are inaccurate or have too less information, and it's more a selling tool. It's not a digital twin where everybody's dreaming about. This means that the models must be better to use the data direct. And what is done today, the precasters has to have to use the data from the BIM model and add a lot of information to the model, like position of reinforcement, um, connections of the elements, a lot of things. But the value of the data is totally underestimated because when we think in the future about digital twins or other things, we have to have a correct model. And a correct model means all the relevant information has to be in the model. And when we have this, we, we can use it. And in the future, who will have the data, who have the power to decide how to build and and in which way to build. How do we see the future of construction with a global view? Because we have, as I said, customers, North America, Europe, and also Asia. And what we see is the companies that are able to produce the data for direct use, they are successful. Why? Because when you produce the data by yourself, you can optimize the product and you can optimize the production. And this leads to the success in the future for the things to come. More prefabrication, more complicated buildings and all of this. <clears throat> and as we see it, the digital twin will be mandatory in the future for 
different types of building like hospitals or other things but also modern houses because a modern house is more like a machine to live in with a lot of things networks and things not like a building 50 100 years ago it was just walls and floors maybe heating system and electricity and this was the house and today a house is much more it has intelligent heating and cooling has a lot of sensors to use energy efficient and everything what is built in this building has a certain location and how can i find it when i have failures how can i maintain it so the need for the digital twin will be bigger and bigger <clears throat> but having to get the digital twin it's important to create all the data in the design phase not to send a robotic dog to the building afterwards to check where are the sensors where are the building or things like that and when data are available we see this the call will become louder to use them to use them in a better way as they use today when we use it in a better way we automatically be more efficient and save energy and material all these things that's also the same with artificial intelligence as we know from all the language models and from all the things i can only train the ai when i have data correct data because incorrect data gives us incorrect answers or incorrect results it means we have to create data in a way that we can feed this into our models and with this information we can see what ai can do to get better buildings or get buildings smarter or get buildings more efficient it means we have to create a lot of data that we can train the ai when we think how much data is needed for a language model which is also complicated but thinking about a new building that should be created by ai we need a lot of data to do this but we have to start and today ai is maybe a dream in some areas it will become it will become reality but it will take time when we have the data and the transformation to digitalization is where all the governments and everybody is dreaming about but how can we transform to digitalization we have to transform this in the technical office not in the production and not on the billing side the hardest part is to make the transformation in the technical office in these areas in the organization this is where the need for transformation is biggest when we do this there then it's easier to do things on the billing side it's easier to do things in the production but without data we can do nothing we cannot automate we cannot be more efficient because lack of information what you see here on this picture is the production plant as a 3d model and then on the picture on the left side on the right side is the production itself it's modern production like mechanical engineering like electro industry this is not what a normal person thinks about building industry but this is where we have to go and this is not the picture below is, is the model but the picture on top is reality this is a brand new factory in budapest hungary where they are producing multi-story buildings for apartments and this is only possible by having data because this is a full automated factory with just a few workers that keep the machines running what is the prefabrication definition to relocate the production process from the construction site to the factory does not mean that we build a tent or a shed or a building and produce in this building in the same way as we do it on the building side because this wouldn't be efficient we need 
structured planning. We need industrial thinking. Means prefabrication is not just relocation into another area to have a bad environment for the workers that it doesn't drain or is cold. We have to think in an industrial way. Means all the processes must be designed, thought through, and then we go into the production process. And not to say, as it is done today, okay, we need enough <clears throat> that we can start building. <clears throat> this is the way to be inefficient, to, to waste material, and to get bad quality. Prefabrication or industrial buildings means industrial thinking starts, as I said before, in the technical office and in the organization in the production, like in mechanical engineering. You have the full set of drawing, the full design, and then we start to produce, not to start producing while planning is still ongoing, because then we find out there are problems, problems must be solved on the building side, this costs time and money, and the data cannot be used for digital twin. Why? Data are incorrect. It's changed on the building side and normally nobody is going back to the drawings, make the corrections or the information where a switch or whatever is built in get lost because nobody measures this afterwards. It's there, but nobody knows why. And third important point is we have to define a product for industrial production, like multi-story buildings, villas, whatever. This is not as it was before, just a problem that must be solved. We need a building, let's build a building. We need a house, let's build a house. It's, we want to build many houses, many buildings in a good quality, in an industrial way. This is then where we get the advantage of prefabrication, not to solve problems on sites or other things. And I think this is for the building industry quite hard. Industrial building system is not another way of building material. Not to say, okay, we use ready mix, now we use precast. The material is the same, but the way to get to the building is a total different one. We have to do this in an industrial way. Means planning, designing, making structure and then start the production and then it is not necessary that architects or other people are going to building site and check why if i send workshop drawings into the factory the factory does all the drawings all the walls the floors stairs whatever as they are on the drawing and then they fit together on the building site and it's not needed to make a lot of corrections on the building side, drilling and cutting and all these things. So industrial way to build is another way to build, not another material. <clears throat> and the automation, which leads us to prefabrication automation goes hand in hand. This is not an end in itself. Automation is also the answer to a lot of challenges that we have had, lack of workforce. Always when I come to Canada, everybody tells me there's a lack of workforce, there's a lack of skilled labor. Yes, that's true. But the way we will, we will not get more and better workforce. So we have to adopt our processes to live with the workforce, with the people we have. And in an industrial process, it's easy because in a car manufacturing conveyor, they are not mechanics that are assembling cars. That are people, they are trained to assemble cars. And it's the same with the industrial process on the building side or in the factory. They are trained on certain processes just for installation or for setting up molds or cutting timber, things like that. And with them, I don't need these very, very experienced workers. I need workers that are willing, they are motivated, and they are trained to work in the factory or on the building side. We can also reduce CO2 emissions because we use the material better. We have less transport. We have less 
environmental impact with waste, dirt, noise, all these things which are normally on the building site. We have a very clean, fast building site. And this will be very important when we build in cities because there is not enough space. And when you look at building sites, for instance, in Japan or other areas where they have nearly no space, this is everything very organized. So the truck gets a slot where it has to come 50 minutes, coming, unloading, off going. And this is only possible with prefabrication and with a very detailed planning. This leads us also to better quality of buildings. Why? We do this in a closed environment. So we get more accuracy, we get better quality, <clears throat> and we can embed things like heating in the wall itself or heating in the floor. Means we can avoid split ACs or other things because the wall and the floor, they can act as heating itself. This gives us also better quality in buildings. And last but not least, health and safety issues on the building side. The more trades I can remove from the building side, the safer and the quieter a building site is. And this comes by using prefabrication and using automation. And there are areas like Malaysia, they have something they call it IBS, industrial building systems. And they tell all the contractors, you can do everything on the building set, but you're not allowed to make waste, dirt, noise, and all the other things. And then how can you do this? You can do this only in an industrial way. And they are very successful with that. And I think this could be also used as an example for other we're also very developed countries like Canada, Europe. We have to do it. And now we are in the stage, we have information, we have automation, but the contractors themselves, they are still a little retarded in their way to use all the new technologies. They do this most of the time as they did it 30, 40 years ago. The prefabrication needs a new way of thinking and acting. And this is most of the time not so much a big problem on the building side. This is more a problem in the organization of the companies itself that planning, organizing, and doing things in a very structured way, they are not used to that. And this is a circle. It starts with the architect and ends with the installation of the building site. And when you not follow this approach, you will waste money and you will fail because then it gets double expensive. If you don't make proper planning, send parts on the building site, which are not totally fit out as they could be, you're losing money, you're losing time and you're losing efficiency. And Prefabrication is a different way of construction, but the change must be done in the organization. The change must be done in the office. There is where we have to start. Create data, create work steps and do this. This is the success for automation. The rest, the factory itself, it's not so complicated. It's most of the time the most important part. Yes, but the breakthrough is the office. The breakthrough is the organization. This must be changed at first. And then after that, we can go to other things like production, installation, all the things. On this slide, you see the workflow in the car cell production. And you see in the middle, the CAD system, master computer, and the rest is just the information goes in and out. And this is how we have to think the we will build in the future. Not the building side is just a small side at the left top corner. And the rest has to be done somewhere else, not on the building side. A few words to the digital twin. How can we create a digital twin in the construction industry? 
In prefabrication, it's quite simple. Why? We have to produce the data for the production. It means we have to define every path, reinforcement, all the geometries, every chamfer, every connections. Easy. I use the data, collect them, and I have the digital twin. And then I get information maybe from other trades like HVAC electricity. And so I get the basis for my digital twin. And with this information, I can hand it over to the future owner. And the future owner has a digital twin and sees where are my connections, where are my bars, where, where are the cables connected, where are my switches, what is in the walls, can I drill a hole or other things. But in most cases, these information are not available in the BIM model today. We have a model that shows just, how to say, the basic information. And maybe one of the problems is when houses are designed today, they are designed from somebody who doesn't care too much about material. It could be concrete, it could be timber or steel or whatever. And this, there the problem starts. In other industry, it wouldn't be possible. Could we think about that somebody builds a car and said, well, I don't know, maybe it's steel, aluminum, timber, I'll make the design. And here the problem starts. We have to change this. We have to think from the first second, this building is a precast building. This building is a timber building. And then all the following steps follow this definition of material. So we have to design it in timber, in concrete hybrid, whatever. With traditional construction methods, how can I get a digital twin? I can get it, I send the robotic dog every day or every half day to the building. The dog creates a pixel cloud and with this pixel cloud, I can have something similar to a digital twin, but not a digital twin itself. I, I, don't, I only can get the information from the surfaces of what is there, but what is inside? If the dog isn't passing by when I put something in, it, the information is gone. And this is the problem with lack of data, lack of information. On this slide, you see when we have in precast a pellet carousel system, I can build thousands of buildings. And when you see the building above and the building below, they are produced basically in the same production unit. And to change over from a villa to an apartment building, I only have to change the data. The rest is there. The, the robots are there, the molds are there, the reinforcement is there. So the factory itself doesn't care. Is it a villa? Is it a high-rise building? It's only the information are changed. I need more reinforcement. Maybe I need a thicker wall, but for the worker, for the machines, it doesn't care. They don't care what they have to produce. They make walls, they make floors, they make stairs, whatever. And then on the billing side, we see the difference that it's multi-story, it's not a villa or whatever. Here, a few pictures about prefab buildings. And you see quality and everything. The quality in very, how to say, competitive markets like Europe, has to be perfect. If you're not able to deliver perfect quality, we will have no customers. Why? Because they go to your colleagues and then they will deliver this quality. A few things to one of our top clients in Canada, Stubbies. Stubbies, they were starting with a precast for agricultural. And from there, 40 years ago, they are now building high-rise buildings. And how do they do this? They bypass the normal construction process. And you see this on the top, uh, on the bottom uh, left slide. They were able to make out of three process, one process. And this is being much easier for all the parties involved. So we get faster bill of quantity, we get faster decisions and 
everything is in the hand of one company. And with this, they are very successful. Why? They can make the process faster and make quality much better. And you find also this information on the Stubby's website. And they designed the entire building out of one hand. And this is the advantage in material savings, in quality, in noise reduction, and in all the things that are needed in the future for the building industry. What are the benefits and advantages? We can save time, we can save uh, construction cost. We don't need skilled workers. We need less training because they are just trained on a trade. We get all the information about materials. We get a better repayment because for a higher return of investment, everything is faster. It doesn't take me a year to get a building. It's just maybe half a year, depends on the size of the building. In the control production process, we can save energy, CO2, a lot of things. And all the environmental requirements that we have to follow, we are much, much better. And at the end of the lifetime, it's also easy to demolish the building. Why? Because I assemble it so I can easily uh, dismantle it just in the reverse direction. And it's not needed to use, I don't know, TNT or other things to do this. I can take it, I can assemble it, I can reassemble it in the same way. The systems also have limitations. The biggest limitation, especially for contractors, is the upfront investment for a production unit. Doesn't matter if it's precast or timber or whatever, is quite high compared to a traditional system. Why? I need a building, I need machines, control systems. I need a lot of other things, transport tracks. And this is when I'm too small or I don't have the market, it is a problem, definitely. Why? Prefabrication industri or industrialization needs bigger scales. If I don't have the scales, if I just build, I don't know, 50 houses a year, one house a week, it doesn't matter if it's small, it doesn't make sense to do this. When I'm in an area, where I can build, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of buildings and houses, it does make sense. And when I cannot run a facility long enough, it also doesn't make sense because to move this from one location to another location, I don't know, 500 kilometers away or so, it doesn't make sense. This is, for this, it's not built for that. It's built to be there for 20 years and then maybe it's dismantled or it's upgraded. Then industrial system makes sense. And prefabrication, as said many times before, needs a different approach to the building itself. And it only makes sense to make prefabrication when I have good planning, when I have industrial thinking. And But the industrial system, doesn't mean that we have mass production in form of very uniform buildings as it is in, I don't know, former East Germany or so. Today, with a modern industrial production system, I can produce unlimited types of buildings with unlimited appearances, facades, whatever colors. This is not a big problem today because we have automation and we have the model. So when we design a new building, we build a new building. For the factory, it's easy. We just have to make the design and the data. I show you at the end a few examples. This is the shell facade and the finished facade. How this precast building can look like and will look like. Why? Because they have to find a market and they have to find buyers which are happy and willing to live inside such buildings. So the uniformity is gone. Nobody wants to have them. Each building will be built and designed individual. As you see, everything can be done. Most of the time, it's only a matter of money. 
how much money and effort I put in a facade. And with this, I get then my special, unique appearance. At the end, when the building comes to the end of its lifetime, it's easy then to dismantle it. I know exact where the walls, the floors are connected and I can cut it off, take it away and then I can easily remove it also when there are buildings around and without noise, without dust, without a lot of things. So this is the last advantage of prefabrication that the building process and the demolishing process is quite similar and it's better for health and safety and all the things. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed and you learned a few things about industrial production. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. <clears throat> that was great. <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, just a reminder uh, to the audience, you can submit your questions uh, via the comment section there. And I'm just going to bring open some of my questions. So, well, actually, Christian, I know we, we discussed a few questions, but I wanted to get your thoughts. Um, I noticed one of your slides said minimum five years um, up to, you know, 20 years or better. Uh, for prefabrication facility. So yeah. in the U.S. here, there's uh, a few years ago, and it wasn't in precast concrete, but it was in, in prefab. So a company called Katera, who a lot of people are familiar with, um, they went under. Uh, since then, some other organizations have acquired uh, some of their old factories. And I know just anecdotally, anecdotally speaking to them that it's been you know, five or six years of investment for them to, because they're, you know, they're, they're contractors, leaders in the construction industry, some of the biggest companies, you know, in, in the construction sector in North America, uh, but they're trying to industrialize. So I guess from your perspective, uh, in your role, like, what do you recommend to those companies, the, you know, whether it's, it's the big general contractors or tier one contractors here, the laying O'Rourke's in the UK, um, et cetera. What would you recommend to them when they're entering this field of industrialized construction or industrial production? And also keeping in mind that they have investors and, st and different stakeholders and shareholders uh, wanting to see a, a financial return. Uh, yeah, the easiest is you look at other industries. And I think what Katyara wants to do is that they say, we know everything. We don't need test factories. We build these huge, fully fledged factories and then produce. And what we learned is most of the time, the startup process is the most complicated one. The more automation, the more complicated it is. And the biggest challenge is when you didn't build prototype buildings before that you learn, this will kill you doesn't matter if it's precast, if it's timber. Look at car industry. They built so many prototypes, test it, and then maybe scrap it. And we see this from our clients. When we have clients, they have and they have the product and they just need, let's say, a better, more modern form of production, it's easy. Why? They have all the processes, they need they know they know all the details. So they had the prototypes. They know how to do this. And when it comes to new clients, they say, yeah, we have a market and we can build houses and this and this. Uh, do you have experience? Yeah, less. Then the problem starts. In tech, the office, all the details. So incorrect data. And a machine has zero failure tolerance. Means either you send the data correct, the machine does it, or if it's just wrong for a millimeter, the worker said, yeah, it's wrong, but I know how to do this, I do this. Mm -hmm. Machine said, sorry, it's incorrect. And this is the problem that investors want to have fast, successful. Ones. And if you tell them, yeah, sorry, we need two years, three years to ramp up, and ah, three years to ramp up, and the money should come back in six years, this is the problem. And 
this was also the same with Ling Rook. So at the end, Ling uh, Ray Rook, the owner, said we want to have the factory. The problem with the with the industry or with the building secret is there is a lack of industrial experience. And everybody said, ah, we built a factory in one or two years, and then we start from zero and we build, I don't know, 50 buildings. And there is the problem. The problem is lack testing, lack of prototypes, and normally you need more time. And when you build a factory in a big area like Toronto, the factory can run for 20, 30 years. Why? The buildings are needed. And this last story is like 3D printing. All these companies, in my opinion, they have more people in marketing than in research. And then you find them in all the media, but not in reality. This is the problem. And our best clients are the clients, they think only about making money. Because this is the best, not to be modern. They just want to make money. And then you get the best solutions. Not, yeah. not to, to impress investors or other things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a balancing act of keeping, you know, the promises to investors versus yeah, uh, yeah, what yeah. the market can handle. And do you think, um, like, I, I've often wondered, and just in your experience around the world, do you think that there's an opportunity for a lot of these factories to actually ramp up production? Like we aren't constrained by their, by their ability to supply more. It's more the market demand. There's too much red tape and barriers constricting the market from, from growing because uh, I'm going to offer my opinion and go back to the question. But my opinion was that the, it, it seems to me like we are, we always know what the need is. And, the, and I'm thinking about housing in Canada, for example, there's a ton of studies telling us what the need is. We have really good builders and manufacturers and, and uh, industrialized production uh, producers, but there's something in the middle constraining it from good, from increasing supply. So do you think it's, it's a bit um, outside the factory, external factors impeding their production or it, at times is it also, you know, the, the design for manufacturing assembly impeding production and the, um, you know, the skill set of the, the workers as well. No, I, I see around the world in Canada too, that most of the contractors, they don't want to change the way how they are working. And mm -hmm. this is the biggest problem that they always think they can only create the value on the building side and everything what they do away from the building side, like in the office, this is not creating value. And this is the problem. When you want to be more efficient, you have to create volume, uh, you create value in the technical office. The better you think about processes, also if you do this traditional, the easier it is on the building side. And the more white spots you lift over, the more you rely on skilled workers on the building side that they see something is missing and that they can do this in the right way. And then this leads to problems in quality and to fights with the future owners and all these things. That you think, ah, I'll make a drawing and the, on the drawing is 50% of the information. And with skilled workers that are motivated, they see it and they correct it. And you don't know it. And if you don't have these workers, you get in trouble. Why? They don't see this, they do something. And then you have, I don't know, mold and leakage and this and this. And that is the problem. And But this is not the Canadian problem. This is the same problem in Europe that everybody thinks, how ah, we have to cut cost. Where can we cut cost? You know, on the building side, we cannot cut cost because we have to build. We cut it in the office and we cut it in the planning process. Yeah. On one hand. But on the other hand, when we look at buildings, buildings get more and more complicated. So... We get less information, less skilled workers, and we should build more complicated building. And how is this going to happen? No, it isn't. Yeah. And this is this is and all the contractors all around the world, not only Canada, they don't want to invest in their technical office in the factory. Yeah. Hoping that all the people on the building side they can do things what they are not trained for. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, they're kind of pushing the both the risk and the the problem solving onto the field, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a question that came in here uh, from Brian. Um, how fast uh, is the prefabrication market growing in Europe, percentage wise, or, or roughly what is it at, or and is it do you see it growing? The when it comes to industrial buildings, it's hundred percent. So all the industrial buildings, they are prefabricated, steel, precast, whatever. In the apartment buildings, the amount of precast is steadily rising. The big problem is like now when we have crisis, then the contractors fall back to old methods. Means a typical contractor, he has, I don't know, 40 workers. And when he has a, a lot of work, he goes to prefabrication. And when the work gets less, he goes back to the old methods like cast in situ or whatever. Why? To keep the workers. And the precaster in Europe is nothing else than a producer of building material. Maybe smarter building material, but building material. But what we see now, there are companies like Goldbeck, they change the process similar to Stubbies. They are full, let's say full supplier. They are not so segmented like there's a precaster and there's a contractor. They go to the end customer. And when going to the end customer, you can influence a lot their opinion and you can also easily sell your system. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I have a couple other questions here that I, I wanted to, to ask. And, and one is, so is it more costly to create data for pre- Production compared to using uh, basic data uh, on a job site, and uh, and just to so I clarified it in my head. I think uh, data for production as like design for manufacturing and assembly, DFMA, which is a, a commonly used acronym. Um, so that versus the traditional conventional construction, what what do you think is more expensive and why? This, this brings us back to the question before with the skilled paper. It's definitely more costly when you produce data for production. My mm-hmm. machines, as I said, has zero failure tolerance. This is the disadvantage. But the advantage is I can also sell to my client a digital twin. I can tell him, look, the data, because no, how it is done now, we create data, the building is built, and the data are then maybe deleted because nobody wants it, mm-hmm. which is a failure. It's more costly. It's more costly to, to create the data for production in automate, with automation. But normally I can also sell it. I sell my data. I sell my model to the future owners and say, look, here you have the hardware and here you have the software. And if you, in the future, you want to change a fuse or so, you take your tablet and you know where it is. But so do you uh do you see uh end users or the owners of that you know that apartment building or that industrial um that in- industrial building do you see them wanting that now more in, in like in, in your experience right now and, and by that i mean like wanting the tecla model to embed into their facility management system or something. is that happening yeah, I'll see it not in apartment currently, but in all, in hospitals or such uh, buildings which are very complicated, which have a lot of technology inside, they want to have it because they need it. Mm-hmm. If there is something happening, how can you find your connection points? How how do you know where it is? And you need this for facility management. You need this for these things. And maybe now the owners don't know that they can ask for it or that they are existing, but it will come like BIM will come. And then maybe the authorities say, okay, we need a BIM model. And maybe they will in the future ask for a hospital. We need a digital twin. We want to have it because if something happens, we have to be fast. Firefighting, all these things. It's easy because we have the technology. We have the tablets. We have everything. What we don't have is correct data. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, in uh, in my experience, uh, obviously, I work in the offsite construction space a bit. And a lot of times, the, I I don't find the owners value that data as much, and I think it's potentially because they're they're not sure how they can use it yet. 
And, and so, like, as you mentioned, in hospitals, schools, different things like this, they have to have it. Well, if it's a, uh, if I personally own a, a relatively small apartment building, I don't necessarily need to know that information. Or, but if you have a large stock of assets of apartment buildings, yeah. it might be useful to have that that information. Yeah. Well, when you want to change something in the future, it's good to know where is a pipe or where is something. Yes. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, um, just one more question. I, I'm monitoring time a bit, but um, what's the difference between producing precast concrete elements versus you know we're we're hearing a lot about uh, mass timber elements or, or uh, wood uh, uh, large precast uh, wood structures? So, what's the difference in, in your opinion? The process is the same. The material is different, but the process should should be the same. And uh, maybe timber is much easier because it's lightweighted. So you maybe just need a shed and you need a few machines and you can build a timber building. With concrete, it's a little complicated because it's heavy. You need more machinery, cranes and other things. But the industrial process is the same. And this is, this, so it makes it easier. When a company has the process, then for them it's easy. When in Europe, we have some companies, they have both. They have timber, they have concrete, and then they have also so-called hybrid elements. Timber with uh, concrete, because uh, you can then with timber, you can replace parts of the reinforcement and these past timber buildings, like, I don't know, so and so many stories, they always have uh, tim they always have precast floors, but the, in the precast floor, the reinforcement is not uh, steel, it's timber. So industrial process should be the same the material and the processes are different but the thinking and the approach should be the same okay yeah um no that's that's great i i was just reflecting on the automotive industry a little bit and and it's the same idea right regardless of the uh the pro the end product um mm -hmm. could be a you know a sports car an suv a, a truck whatever it might be the the process and methodology is is the same um, so next question, and, and I think this will be the last, unless we have another come through, uh, from the audience, but, um, how important is the BIM model for the automatic prefabrication of components? And in the other piece, I want to add to it just to, to, uh, hopefully make you think a little bit is, um, what do you do when that system breaks down do you when you're working with companies or factories or, or companies looking to open a factory it is every piece in in the assembly line if one breaks down does it throw off the whole assembly line or how do you mitigate the risk uh, of the different um, stations within the, the line um when you have the bim model the bim model itself is very important when it's complete and then there's CAD systems, you take the BIM model and then you click on the walls and tell the walls, you are now solid walls, whatever. And then there's an algorithm and then makes automatically workshop drawings out of this wall. And then the workshop drawings are translated in machine language. And this, then it's more like a HTML file and you send it over to the factory and the factory then selects information for geometry information for other things and when the machine breaks down then it's only parts of information there are also if a machine breaks down the information is never lost there are some machines or normally what we know is they what to say 95 percent of the time the machines are able to work there are every day breakdowns, but most of the breakdowns, they are like the machine said, uh, please, can you check? I have a problem with my sensor. And then somebody has to go there and say, okay, the gripper is open or is closed or whatever, because you know, the sensors, the sensors are protecting the machines. And if the machine comes in a status where it's undefined, so it has to stop and the, uh, the operator has to come and to check. These are more the breakdowns and this takes in normally between three and five minutes and they're between these machines, there are buffer zones 
And so you, you can keep up if the machine breaks down for five to 10 minutes. It, it's not a big effect in the whole in the whole production line. But if one machine breaks down, the other machines, they can still continue. Why? They normally use different data. The data come into the factory and then they are selected and supplied to different machines. And every machine gets special data. And only this data they, that the machine needs. So it means if one machine breaks down, the other machine can continue as long as there's material or there's tables or there's something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was, uh, thank you for that. That question has come up uh, when we've worked with some companies before because, you know, they're investing heavily and their factory space is limited, but they're trying to maximize it. And so if, you know, one station breaks down, they kind of have a, a spot off to the side for uh, for doing it manually. But uh, but that's that's no. not I, I don't this work is not that concrete as as much as you. Yeah, I know. And that's the that's the difference between Ford when Henry Ford opened and Toyota when they entered North America. It's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you see, you have to make a machine as reliable as possible. And when we look at cars, we don't have two engines and eight wheels. Build it in a reliable way, and then you use it and never make such bypasses because then you can forget about efficiency and all the things. Yeah, yeah. Now that makes sense. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Christian. Um, just before we wrap up, I, I want to... Uh, remind the audience that uh, Building Transformations has the 10th an anniversary award show happening December uh, 5th in in uh, Toronto. So just a reminder to check out the nominees on the website um, and uh, get your tickets for that. It'd be great. I, I, I'll be there and, and hopefully get to see some, some members. Uh, Christian, thanks again. I know you were at our event in Toronto, mm -hmm. so we appreciate you taking the time. Um, and if anyone wants to go back and, and rewatch or, or, or reach out to Christian, either you, you can go to his LinkedIn, uh, the Pearl Hoffer Consulting website, or um, and and check out the Building Transformations uh, YouTube channel for for more information. So, what I wanted to say, if somebody wants to learn a lot more about automation in about four weeks time from now, the engineering days in Salzburg, and this is where all the European precast industry is meeting, and there you have a lot of lectures and other things. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. We'll, we'll keep you. an eye on that for as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Um, we'll talk soon. Thanks.